Does this mean we're we're up and live? Ah, oh, okay. Well, uh, hello, hola, bonjour. Uh, my name is Donald Kingsbury. Uh, I'd like to thank you, welcome you all to this presidential roundtable session on Extractivismo en las Americas, an event that's being co-sponsored by LASA and the Canadian Association of Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Just a reminder for people that we have simultaneous translation that you can access via your uh, your uh, the, either the bar at the bottom of your screen or the options menu at the top of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're on. And we're also on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I join you today from Toronto, uh, a city that's built on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. It's a city that's home to many diverse First Nations peoples, Inuit and Meti, both from what is now known as Canada and from throughout our world. It's my hope and believe our hope that acknowledging and honoring these presences can be steps towards repairing the broken treaty relations that continue to find this place and shadow it. I also wanna add that in considering this acknowledgement today, I was struck by the fact that whether we're speaking from Canada, from the United States, from Ecuador, from Uruguay, and everywhere that members of the audience are joining us from, we're all situated on territories that are continually shaped by ongoing processes of conquest and dispossession, but also of resistance and of creation. And that the question of extraction and the ideology of extractivism has been and remains central to these processes. Antes de las introducciones de nuestras participantes, quisiera decir un poco sobre el cohost de este evento la Asociación Canadiense de Estudios Latinoamericanos Caribes. Somos una asociación académica internacional dinámica y diversa con base en Canadá que fomenta la investigación y la enseñanza disciplinaria e interdisciplinaria. La asociación semina y moviliza el conocimiento sobre América Latina y el Caribe y sus diásporas por medio de redes de colaboraciones en Canadá y en el extranjero. Esta colaboración entre LASA y ACELAC ha sido un gran placer por mí, por nuestra organización y un honor. Quisiera expresar mis gracias, mis gracias profundas a la presidenta de LASA, Gioconda Herrera, y todo su equipo. Bueno, estamos aquí hoy porque la extracción de los recursos naturales ha definido las posiciones de América Latina y Canadá en la economía global desde la época colonial. Este, esta mesa reúne perspectivas críticas sobre los extractivismos en América Latina y en la Canadá, con atención a los ciclos de luchas indígenas, ecologías y territoriales, y las posibilidades que ellas llevan por mundos diferentes, mejores, más inclusivos y sostenibles. Y ahora es mi gran placer introducir los panelistas de esta mesa presidencial. Primero, uh, Kukpi Judy Wilson of the Nesquamith Band has served her community for over 10 years as chief and eight years as council member. She's a strong advocate for recognition of inherent title and rights, and self, or title rights and self-determination and for the fundamental shifts needed for the survival of all peoples. She's a member of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs Executive, a Secretary Treasurer, the First Nations Leadership Council, the Assembly of First Nations Lands, Territories and Resources Committee, the Assembly of First Nations Chiefs Committee on Climate Change, as well as several other community-based organizations and initiatives. And I'll introduce everybody and then ask uh, um, Chief Wilson to take the proverbial microphone. Um, we also have with us Patricia Walinga, lideresa histórica del pueblo originario Quichua Sariaku, luchadora por los derechos indígenas y de la naturaleza, representante del pueblo Sariaku ante la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos en la causa ganada contra la explotación petrolera en su territorio en el año 2012. Kirsten Franciscone is the Latin American Program Coordinator at Mining Watch Canada, where she accompanies communities and organizations confronting Canadian mining companies. 
She's also a PhD candidate in anthropology and political economy at Carleton University in Ottawa, where she currently researches labor and livelihoods and the links to the Anthropocene at small scale and industrial mining sites in Potosí, Bolivia. Eduardo Gudinas is an investigator del Centro Latinoamericano de Ecología Social in Montevideo, Uruguay. Desde hace más de tres décadas sigue la problemática del desarrollo, el ambiente y los movimientos sociales en América Latina. Es investigador asociado en el Departamento de la Antropología de la Universidad de California en Davis, uh, los Estados Unidos. Fue el primer latinoamericano en recibir la cátedra uh, Arnie Ness en Ambiente y Justicia Global de la Universidad de Oslo, en Noruega, y fue Research Fellow del Centro de Estudios Avanzados de la Universidad de Múnich en Alemania. Sus últimos libros, entre muchos otros, son sobre extractivismos y derechos de la naturaleza publicado en Argentina, Brasil, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador y Perú. En inglés, su más reciente libro es Extractivisms, uh, published by Fernwood Press. Um, finally, uh, and this is alphabetical, not, not by order of importance, but also order of speaking. Uh, Theo Rio Francos is an associate professor of political science at Providence College, uh, an Andrew Carnegie fellow and a Radcliffe Institute fellow. Her research focuses on extraction of resources, on renewable energy, climate change, green technology, social movements, and the left in Latin America. These themes are explored in her book, Resource Radicals from Petro Nationalism to Post Extractivism in Ecuador, as well as in her co authored volume, A Planet to Win Why We Need a Green New Deal. She's a member of the Democratic Socialists of America and serves on the organization's Green New Deal campaign committee. Now we'll proceed with two rounds of, uh, and, and this would be the point where everybody in the audience would would clap because this is an amazing panel of amazing people, um, but we're not in a, in a hall. So we'll just have to dar abrazos virtuales. Um, we'll do two rounds of uh, commentary and discussion amongst the panelists. Uh, and then we'll move into a more open conversation. A reminder that on the Zoom webinar, there's a Q&A function um, as well as a chat. And again, another reminder that uh, there is simultaneous translation available uh, in English Spanish, or Spanish, and that we are on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, so we'll begin with uh, Cookby Wilson before we move on to Kirsten Francescone, then Patricia Gualinga, Eduardo Gudinas, and then Bea Rio Francos. So please, Chief Wilson, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> White Kukraitep. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Cookie Judy Wilson. I'm from the Nisqanath Indian Band, which is an unceded territory in the Sequatchie Nation. We're one of the largest uh, tribes or bands in the, uh, or nations in the interior of British Columbia. We used to have about 32 uh, of our communities or campfires, they were called, uh, prior to bands. Um, but with the two epidemics of so smallpox, we're reduced to two or 3,000 people out of hundreds, a thousand, and then uh, 17 bands today and um, about 10,000 registered sequentum, probably almost double uh, concerning, you know, the, the ones that aren't registered. So our, our nation is building back up. And I'm part of the union, the BC Indian Chiefs Executive, I'm a secretary treasurer. I've been involved with the union for a long time, uh, three terms at least, but my uh, um, uncle, George Manuel, was one of the founding members, as well, as well as my father, Grand Chief Joe Manuel. And so the family's been in politics for a long time, and our nation has been involved in a lot of the world politics, as well as the national and provincial politics. And it's always been about the issues of protecting our land, our title rights, and our people. And I'm also part of the First Nations Leadership Council in, uh, in British Columbia. And I serve on many uh, Assembly of First Nation tables as per my introduction. I wanted to uh, also thank Morris from, uh, from the Union BC and Chiefs. Uh, he's here as well. Uh, he works with the Union BC and Chiefs. I'm not sure if there's any other staff, but I think just Morris. So uh, welcome him. And I always acknowledge Grand Chief uh, 
Stuart Phillip as well. He's been on many front lines and he's been arrested in the Trans Mountain Pipeline struggle as well at Burnaby Mountain. So we, we have quite uh, big shoes to fill at the Union Base Indian Chiefs. But I'm here, I'm very pleased to be here today because, uh, you know, like um, <clears throat> what's happening globally in regards to mining pipelines and all the extractive resource industry, our people here are just as much uh, oppressed through these uh, the industry operating in our, our unceded territories. The majority of BC uh, is not uh, under the treaty process or the modern treaty process for so many of our nations like, like mine, the Sequepum, were unseated, were not ever surrendered or encumbered or sold or relinquished in any way. Uh, so the province or the Canada does not have a deed uh, or any title, any paper they can show that they have title to our lands. Uh, all they did was, you know, annex our lands uh, through legislation and policy and something called the Doctrine of Discovery, uh, which is told, as many of our nations globally know, that's a, a fiction, fiction and it's not real. Uh, they can't uh, show it, but they still use it in our courts and, and everything, even though we won about over 150 court cases to date, uh, they still have this uh, underlying title, they call it. <clears throat> so. Uh, the uh, modern treaty process until recently uh, only allow, uh, now allows the recognition for First Nations uh, and town rights through treaty process. However, in this modern treaty process, language still exists where our rights will be extinguished or impacted if a nation enters into the modern treaty. As well, uh, modern treaties vest title to our lands in the crown so that would, uh, crown laws would apply. We only get a certain percentage of our, um, our lands uh, and then the crown would assume the rest. <clears throat> Aboriginal title that is First Nations own our lands, our um, inher uh, inherited lands. And it's been proven in the Supreme Court of Canada with the Chilcotin case was one of the, the recent cases, but it was a juxtaposition in that case also acknowledging the underlying title of the crown so that it, but still there was recognition for uh, the Chilcotin nation in regards to land title. The, the Union of East Indian Chiefs, as I mentioned, we were for, uh, founded in 1969 after a long struggle for the recognition of our First Nations Todd and rights in British Columbia, namely the white paper policy. They were again trying to impose policy over us. Uh, the Union of BC and Chiefs work collectively with Indigenous nations in BC to act as an advocacy body to provide a, a cohesive voice regionally, nationally, and internationally in support of Indigenous nations and communities. So I've been over to Geneva and to New York and different places, uh, and we've been on international panels. Uh, the Guatemalan one and the mining one was, uh, I think, a year, year and a half ago, maybe two in Vancouver and uh, that was an important one when, because it was our mining companies in Canada uh, exploiting and oppressing the nations in Guatemala. So um, we did uh, participate in that panel that was held in Vancouver. So we uh, work with our First Nation communities uh, to promote and protect each nation's exercise of their own sovereignty within their traditional territories. And we've also worked very tirelessly to uh, fight for First Nations inherent right and titles, and has always stood for First Nations outside of treaty. So uh, with the Union of BC and Chiefs, uh, you know, we've been quite involved with the United Nations Declaration on the, on the Rights of Indigenous People that was endorsed by Canada in the United Nations uh, in 2016. And legislation has been introduced at the federal level to implement the declaration that under the uh, C-15. So that's uh, actively happening right now. And in uh, 2019, the province of British, British Columbia passed uh, Bill 41 into legislation to implement the declaration in the province. So they uh, did legislation to uh, as an action plan to implement. But I have to say, uh, since that time, uh, we still don't quite have an action plan, and uh, there's been uh, little work. Not uh, you know, for our part, we've been pushing to have a full implementation, but uh, we still have yet to see one. And so we've been a big part of that work is the alignment of provincial laws with the declaration. Uh, so you, you know that would be a lot of work in uh, in uh, re realigning those colonial laws. Uh, although First Nations have critical piece of the legislation, uh, we are still subject to the violation of our rights, most notably the free prior informed consent. 
and um, which needs to be fully recognized and implemented if governments of Canada and BC are serious about the declaration. So that's our, our big uh, issue here. Indeed, we're seeing that uh, the free prior informed consent is a critical component to recognition upholding Indigenous people rights. I recently attended the 2019 session of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, where it was quite seen quite plainly that the when the governments, the states, you know, meaning Canada, when they're flaunting around, you know, free prior informed consent, um, you know, our Indigenous peoples and our land are suffering because a lot of the unilateral decisions that are still made in regards to extract. Uh, resources, extraction resources. So in the Canadian context, the lack, the lack of free prior informed consent can be seen on the ground and the issues surrounding the coastal gas link pipeline through Wet'suwet'en territory and the hereditary chiefs who are opposing it and the matriarchs, the clan mothers. And the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is right through my our territory, the Sequatin territory, it's about 513 or 18 kilometers through our territory, many of it waterways. And then also we can see through other nation territories uh, by the federal government, the intent to expand mining activity and dumping of mine effluent in the Fraser River at the Gibraltar mine in Chilcotin territory as well as the intent to mine the Skagit headwaters in the south uh, western BC by Imperial Metals. And the same co company was responsible for the Mount Polly mining uh, tail, tail pond uh, disaster where not, no one was ever held accountable. And that went into, uh, you know, um, the lakes and, you know, the, we don't know the effect yet. Uh, it was released into Quinell Lake uh, after a tailing pond dam failure. Um, and we have lots of issues uh, happening right now that are live on old growth logging. Some of the beautiful cedars are being logged out over at Gitsan. Uh, the people there are making their stand there. And also in Ferry Creek on the island, people are also standing up uh, opposing uh, old growth uh, logging out of their territories. So the uh, state strategies to delay the implementation of uh, the declaration in BC, although we work in collaboration with the province, a lot of change still needs to occur with the government structure for our rights as First Nations to be fully respected. Evidence of the work needed to be, can be found in the state's use of militarized police to suppress land defenders in Wet'suwet'en, as well as the increased policing activities in my own Sequatin territory against you know, some of our land defenders and on uh, at Tiny House Warriors and Burnaby Mountain. So, there's uh, things that have been happening in, in regards to that. And other instances occur the strategy of talk and log where the province is doing something to conserve forests uh, or talking with nations and their rights, but yet the resource, resource extraction continues and uh, the old growth is logged out. These practices need to stop in, in the province of BC and if Canada and the province are serious about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So I, I probably could have added more examples, but those are some of the examples we brought internationally uh, to the United Nations. I'm very happy to bring uh, you know, light to these issues to the Latin American Congress. I really hope that you know, we can share our struggles uh, together with the other Indigenous nations that are, are impacted and uh, imposed upon the state governments in regard to extractivism. And uh, I'm looking forward to the second round in the discussions and dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Kupi Wilson. Um, and you know, the, the sad reality is you, you certainly could have continued to go on um, because it, it is, you know, you know better than I do, an ongoing and deepening process. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of points of convergence that you've given us to, to consider. Um, Next, we'll have uh, Kirsten Francescone from, from Mining Watch Canada. Uh, Kirsten. Thanks, Donald. Uh, uh, so I just wanted to add, thanks for the introduction. I just wanted to add that I'm calling in from unceded territory, Algonquin territory in, in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And I'm currently on maternity leave uh, from my position uh, of Latin American Program Coordinator at Mining Watch. Um, but today I will be speaking um, from my perspective as a, as a staff employee at that organization. Um, so Mining Watch is a Canadian NGO founded by Canadian unions and civil society organizations. And for over 20 years, we've been fighting to achieve corporate accountability in Canada for Canadian mining operations at home and abroad. 
Uh, similarly, we've been accompanying frontline communities and organizations and their often tense relationships with mining companies. Um, so when I was thinking about this panel and how I was going to open my, my presentation today, uh, I thought it might be best to provide a more global outlook of the main themes that I suspect my fellow panelists will be touching on um, from their own presentation. So that is how extractivism is producing the conditions where widespread resistance to mining and other indust extractive industries has become quite commonplace in the Americas. And I think we can think of the most, in my mind, the most emblematic example of this uh, would be um, a place, a country like Chile, which is the world's most important uh, global producer and exporter of copper, um, having uh, widespread massive mobilizations that not only challenge mining as uh, a mode of economic development, but also challenge the underlying capitalist um, system and those relations of production. Um, we saw the sort of conglomeration of the movements in Chile um, moving around some of the issues of mining in, in the fall of 2019 and mobilizations that were brutally repressed by the Chilean state and then consolidating themselves just recently uh, in important constituent uh, assembly member elections. And so I think uh, we can see Chile as part of a broader movement across the Americas to sort of challenge this, this what was often hege hegemonically known as a dominant development paradigm. Um, and so I think at the global level, what's perhaps clear um, is that ex the exploiting of nature and labor for profit by foreign state actors is not a new phenomenon. But it's true that there has been an intensification and generalization of the exploitation of land and labor across the globe in order to satisfy the demand of what is now a truly globalized capitalist world market fueled by unbridled consumption. This is as true for the global south as it is for so-called developed nations. Canada, the US and Europe have also experienced a boom in primary material production. And due to changes in technology, bigger, dirtier, more expensive mines are being built to meet this growing industrial demand at the expense of worker and community health, indigenous livelihoods in our planet. The operators of these mines in their host countries, unsurprisingly, probably to those of us on the panel today, are responsible for egregious attacks against people in the planet and their actions almost nearly always rest in total impunity. We started to hear some of that from, from Chief Wilson just, just now. Um, so it's this unabashed impunity that's important context, I think, for the emergence of the widespread mobilizations that are questioning uh, mining as an economic driver of development and also the capitalist model within which it thrives. And that's what I want to sort of pause on today for my intervention. Um, this impunity is not natural. It's not a product of weak, weak state management or abandonment like we often talk in, or we hear speaking from policymakers and, and circles in development studies. It is actually the fact, it, it, it is in fact a product of a very specific policy decisions at national and international levels drafted and promoted by wealthy nations which enable a culture of corporate impunity prioritizing profit over human lives and nature. So before closing my intervention, I wanna look quickly at the illustration of how this happened specifically in Canada. And I think it's important for our context today in this panel, since over 60% of the world's mining companies are headquartered in this country. And that is, there's very particular reasons as to why that, 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 that that's happening. They aren't here because we have a lot of young white men that want to strike it rich off of vein, although that is an important factor that plays into why these companies are here. But it's actually because the Canadian government, thanks to the industry's corporate capture of the state and its institutions, has implemented very specific policies and refused to implement others. The Canadian state is a pro-mining state at its core, with all of its major, major parties time and time again, be them liberal, conservative, uh, green, quote unquote, uh, continue to promote impunity in order to benefit the shareholders of these companies and their government cronies. So for example, the Toronto Stock Exchange, the largest stock exchange on, in the world for, ge for generating um, mining venture capital uh, is notorious for its nearly non-existent regulatory oversight and unwillingness to sanction violators. It's narrow parameters put placed, placed on determining mater material impacts and for encouraging speculation and over-evaluation of deposits. The Canadian government itself provides a tax haven for, mine, for the mining and oil and gas sector, providing tax rebates for exploration expenses, tax credits for costs incurred in Canada, providing infrastructure development for projects on, on the go, and even providing exploration uh, rebates to companies operating abroad. As a government, we have directly drafted the neoliberal mining codes uh, in countries like Chile, Peru, and Colombia in order to limit those states' ability to capture rent to prevent environmental disaster and re remediation. And we provide diplomatic and consular support to any company seeking to operate abroad, even when it's known to have committed human rights and environmental violations. In Canada, our regulatory framework to protect the environment is offloaded to the provinces and is laughably absent and weak. 
unable to prevent and then punish disasters like uh, Chief Wilson just mentioned, the, the disaster of Mont Pauly, for example, which is the, the, big, the largest tailing disaster in recent history that, we've, that BC faced uh, and that affected many indigenous communities uh, and, and settler communities in that region. We actively promote impunity by failing to implement binding legislation to protect, to protect human rights defenders and the environment abroad. And we continue to draft and sign on to free trade agreements, which enable companies, no matter how small, no matter how violent or how irresponsible, to sue sovereign states when their assets are deemed no longer of value to that country. The famous ISDS clauses present in nearly all bilateral and multilateral trade agreements to which Canada is a signatory party effectively muzzle governments from protecting their environments or force states to repress their people in order to protect the primacy of private property. These reasons and others explain why the majority of these companies are listed in Canada. If another country were to provide similar benefits or better benefits, and we've seen this with the fiscal paradises in the Caribbean, then companies would flock there as well. This, is, this just recently happened with Barrett Gold when they moved their head offices from Canada to Jersey. And so, although capitalist mining is not new to Canada, nor its companies, the heyday for companies doing whatever they want, whenever they want, and however they want is certainly upon us. Canada, at the behest of the Mining Association of Canada and other lobbying groups for the industry, actively promotes a race to the bottom approach to regulations and legislation at home and abroad, the impacts of which we have, we have been and continue to be devastating. It is that same culture of impunity, though, that I believe is contributing to this overall questioning of the capitalist paradigm and the fact that our comrades across Canada and throughout the Americas have begun to build alliances around these issues provides promising leads for the future of a more globalized resistance movement against the depredatory impacts of mining and capitalist economic development. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Kirsten, um, for, for putting that into perspective and, and giving some more detail on the Canadian state's complicity and, and eager participation um, in these, these processes that you and, and Dr. Wilson have, have laid out in, in such detail. Señorita, uh, vamos a mudar al Ecuador y Patricia Walinga va a dar la palabra. Patricia. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias, Donald. Y gracias por la invitación para poder compartir nuestro punto de vista y nuestras experiencias. En este momento me encuentro en la ciudad de Puyo, que es la capital de la provincia de Pastaza, pero yo soy del pueblo originario quichua de Sarayacu, que está uh, lejos, un poco lejos de acá. Quisiera compartirles que muy a pesar de que sabemos de que los pueblos indígenas tenemos similitud de problemas, eh, y algunos casos exitosos que, o que lo denominan exitosos como es el caso del pueblo Sarayacu, los problemas continúan y continúan porque la industria extractiva no ha parado. Tanto el petróleo como la minería, como las madereras y las aperturas de carreteras son el día a día de la lucha de los pueblos indígenas. Y esto ha hecho que muchos pueblos estén luchando permanentemente, mientras los gobiernos, así sean de tendencias de izquierda o derecha, tienen un modelo económico extractivista y basan en eso. Así tengamos eh, personería jurídica o títulos de propiedad de nuestros territorios, la Constitución del Ecuador dice que cuando se trate de interés nacional, ellos podrían explotar territo eh, en territorios indígenas, ellos tomarían la decisión. Y, el, y, con esta, y con este contexto se abren más y más las fronteras petroleras. Ya tenemos el ejemplo del nororiente del Ecuador, donde ha habido todo un desastre ambiental generado por Chevron. Estamos hablando ahora de la zona del centro sur, donde se quiere ampliar más la frontera extractiva. Y está la zona del sur, donde la minería a gran escala está ya afectando fuertemente al territorio Shuar. Entonces, este, había una pregunta por ahí que habían puesto como pregunta guía de si los pueblos indígenas vemos como una oportunidad el tema de, del extractivismo. Yo creo que más, más que una oportunidad, lo vemos como un peligro tan real de destrucción de los pueblos indígenas, porque nuestra lucha se genera en desigualdad de condiciones y no es una lucha que sea fácil, es una lucha que es absolutamente difícil en desigualdad de condiciones en un contexto que no es de los pueblos indígenas, en un contexto absolutamente externo, como ocurrió con el caso Sarayaco. Ha, ha pasado 
eh, ya muchos años de lo que fue la sentencia, se ha cumplido a medias la sentencia del caso Sarayacu, todavía tenemos ahí tonelada y media de explosivos en territorio Sarayacu que no se han extraído, y un punto clave que fue el tema de la sentencia del caso Sarayacu, que fue la consulta libre, previa e informada, que tenía que ver con el consentimiento de los pueblos indígenas cuando vean afectados sus territorios. Puntos que no han sido cumplidos para nada y por lo cual se sigue generando problemas. Entonces, más que oportunidad, nosotros vemos problemas. Obviamente, siempre encontramos en este proceso de lucha eh, gente dispuesta a solidarizarse con nosotros, a escucharnos, pero eso es, eh, muchas veces no es suficiente. Porque hay tantos casos, tantos pueblos, hay varios frentes. Ahorita mismo están tratando de explotar el bloque 28, que está en las fuentes de agua más importantes de la provincia, de donde nacen las afluentes del Amazonas. Están abriéndose nuevamente nuevos bloques donde tratan de actuar, donde actúan, no, no es que tratan, de una manera perversa, tratando de ingeniarse cómo pueden engañar a los pueblos indígenas. ¿Cómo pueden hacer para que la consulta no tenga que ver nada con el consentimiento? Porque según el, el, los gobiernos o los ministerios, el consentimiento no tiene que ser vinculante y la consulta es tomada como una mera forma de socialización hacia los pueblos indígenas. Mientras nosotros decimos que la consulta es vinculante porque así, lo, primero por nuestro derecho constitucional y segundo porque el que no tenga consentimiento quita el principio básico de lo que es la consulta el espíritu de la consulta, y tercero, porque no tiene sentido que nos vengan a consultar y después decir, miren, no importa la respuesta que tengan, porque vamos a explotarles igual. Entonces, estas son las realidades que siempre estamos viviendo todos los días, con peligro, con amenazas, y obviamente ahí viene todo el tema de las amenazas a los líderes, de criminalización a las comunidades, como ha ocurrido con nuestro pueblo, con judicialización a todos los que están protestando, una serie de cosas que se, están en absolutamente desiguales, en desigualdad de condiciones. Son realidades que vivimos en el día a día de nuestra lucha, de nuestra resistencia, como, como gente que estamos defendiendo estos espacios. Pero no hay que olvidar que, por ejemplo, aquí en Ecuador, las rondas petroleras se han tenido que detener gracias a la lucha de los pueblos indígenas. Si no hubiera habido lucha ya hace mucho tiempo que ya hubieran avanzado mucho más con las rondas petroleras. Y este gobierno que acaba de entrar tiene su política basada en economía en combustibles fósiles. El gobierno anterior igual y el anterior igual. O sea, para nosotros, los pueblos indígenas, todo el tema de extracción es no, independientemente de tendencias de políticas de izquierda o derecha. O sea, todos han basado su modelo económico en combustibles fósiles. Y, y realmente hay un problema muy grande en esto. Cabe decir que hay gobiernos también que han hecho venta anticipada de petróleo, que han, que han, que han dejado y endeudados, ya, sin consultar, sin tener nuestro, nuestro ya, ya tenemos ya concesiones, ya tenemos establecido bloques petroleros que vamos a tener que estar continuamente vigilantes porque ya están intentando ingresar. Entonces, esta... Esa es la realidad. Más que oportunidades para nosotros son problemas graves. Si lo vemos como oportunidad, tal vez sea en el sentido que aprendimos a luchar, que aprendimos a saber de las leyes, que aprendimos a hablar, que aprendimos a denunciar, que aprendimos a valorar nuestro, a, a decir aquí no ingresan porque aquí es nuestro territorio, aunque eso cueste la vida de muchos líderes. Entonces, esta, esta es una situación que, que es todo, del día a día, y, que, y, y si hablamos no solamente de Sarayacu, sino de todos los pueblos indígenas de la zona. Muchos otros pueblos a los que se les dice que, que, que gracias a eso pueden tener educación, pueden tener salud, pueden tener, son condicionamientos que la empresa genera. Para, por último diré, cuando ingresa una empresa petrolera a territorios indígenas, esta empresa es el gobierno en ese territorio. El Estado o los gobiernos no tienen nada que ver en ese territorio porque la empresa se constituye en un gobierno. Y esa es la realidad. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Patricia, eh, por su perspectiva y su historia. Eh, hay muchísimas perspectivas importantes que tenemos que considerar eh, juntos. 
eh, por ejemplo, eh, la continuación de, del extractivismo es entre todos los gobiernos, de la izquierda, de la derecha, y la necesidad, porque no hay ninguna otra vía que, que la lucha, la lucha colectiva indígena y todo el mundo en contra de, de, la, de los procesos de, de disposición. Eh, pues, pero no es mi turno, es eh, ahorita tenemos Eduardo Guilinas. Uh, Eduardo. Bueno, muchas gracias, muy agradecido por la invitación y como Donald me ha dado solamente siete minutos, voy a ser muy concreto porque he tomado cinco puntos, cinco reflexiones para compartir con ustedes pensando los extractivismos, pero en la perspectiva o volcado hacia el rol de los investigadores, los académicos, y el quehacer de las ciencias sociales. Y para ordenarme en ello, y para facilitar que me sigan, voy a compartir con ustedes unas láminas muy simples. El primer apunte tiene que ver con la distinción entre impactos locales y efectos de derrame. Existe una abundante bibliografía, existen muchos conflictos, enorme volumen de material sobre denuncias, estudios, etcétera, de los impactos locales como pueden ser contaminación, efectos sobre la biodiversidad, violaciones de derechos o la dinámica de conflictos. Impactos locales, por lo tanto, referidos a los enclaves donde operan emprendimientos extractivos. Pero existen menos, menos estudios en los llamados efectos de derrame, que son las modificaciones en las políticas públicas y en los conceptos que sostienen las políticas públicas asociadas a esos extractivismos y que no están directamente vinculadas a los enclaves porque afectan a todo el país y en todo un territorio. Y me refiero con ello, por ejemplo, al debilitamiento del de juego democrático para imponer emprendimientos extractivos o la erosión de la salvaguarda de derechos o la reterritorialización que está en marcha en varios países. Un segundo problema que veo es una cierta manía, una cierta dificultad en repetidos inicios de volver a abordar una y otra vez los mismos problemas donde no siempre se hacen avances sustantivos precisamente por ese recomenzar. Me voy a referir especialmente a algunos de ellos que están nuevamente en debate. Por ejemplo, el papel de la propiedad de los recursos naturales y la supuesta nacionalización o estatización de ellos como solución para los impactos de los extractivismos o para sus efectos de derrame. Y la dificultad en separar propiedad de recursos naturales del acceso a los recursos naturales. Me refiero también a los abordajes a veces simplificados del rol que pueda tener cambiar el marco de tributos, impuestos, regalías, donde si hay una mayor captura del Estado, eso ya representaría un alivio de los extractivismos cuando no, eso no ocurre. Cualquiera de estas dos condiciones que acabo de comentar, la experiencia ecuatoriana, la experiencia que ha relatado Patricia Gualinga, es claro. Recuerdo una visita a, a Ecuador, me hace acordar ahora Patricia, cuando estaba por visitar la zona de Puyo, en un viaje que continuó en el norte de Ecuador, en una comunidad local, los comunarios me decían, si la empresa es estatal o transnacional, si paga más o menos regalía, el impacto en nuestra comunidad es el mismo. Esto está nuevamente en el tapete, especialmente por el proceso constitucional en marcha ahora en Chile, o es una discusión actualmente también en proceso por la segunda ronda electoral en el balotaje en Perú. Un tercer aspecto tiene que ver con la definición. Si yo tomo en consideración la inicial definición de extractivismo, que era bastante precisa, en los últimos años se han ido sumando cada vez más definiciones y ahora hay extractivismos como adjetivos para multitud de problemas de situaciones financiero, cognitivo, epistemológico, etcétera, etcétera. A mi modo de ver, 
a mayor amplitud de esas definiciones, más imprecisión en qué toman en cuenta. Y esa imprecisión tiene un efecto clave en que cada vez son más inefectivas para discutir alternativas y construir alternativas a los impactos locales y a los procesos locales en marcha en muchos sitios. Y además no tienen en cuenta el contexto político en el cual se dan estas discusiones, porque es una de las grandes, uno de los grandes eslogans de gobiernos, empresas y buena parte de la academia, decir que extractivismo es todo, es casi todo. Esto me lleva entonces al cuarto punto para compartir con ustedes, que son esas historias olvidadas de los extractivismos. Yo soy bastante escéptico de buena parte de la literatura que dice que los conflictos sobre los extractivismos o la importancia de la territorialidad y el abordaje ambiental son un hecho reciente o novedoso. En realidad, cuando uno busca, explora en las historias, hay conflictos, por ejemplo, vinculados a los extractivismos de principios del siglo XX. Creo que este es otro de los grandes temas en que es urgente rescatar esas historias olvidadas, porque buena parte de las dinámicas que ahora están en marcha son parte de una memoria larga que repite o regenera alguna de esas problemáticas y de esos conflictos. Como último punto, también siguiendo una de las preguntas de Donald y también tomando lo que acaba de decir Patricia Walinga, Donald preguntaba, bueno, ¿hay una ideología, es un problema de ideología los extractivismos? Claro que depende de cómo se entienda ideología, pero si yo la tomo, la palabra, en los usos tradicionales, podría decir, siguiendo también a Patricia, que los extractivismos se repiten bajo regímenes políticos, ideológicos, de muy distintos signos, tanto progresistas como conservadores. Por lo tanto, estamos lidiando con algo que es previo a esas ideologías, por lo menos en sus expresiones político-partidarias. Esto indica que estamos frente a una problemática que tiene raíces culturales, raíces ontológicas más profundas de lo que concebimos, y que por lo tanto, si las disciplinas convencionales, que son parte de esos mismos acervos de saber, de investigar, de esas mismas epistemologías, se ven en dificultades para poder desentrañarlas, porque eso implicaría desobedecer, quebrar o ir más allá de estas epistemologías contemporáneas. Entonces, cumpliendo con el pedido de, de Donald, esos son los cinco puntos clave que tenía para compartir con ustedes frente a los extractivismos. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Eduardo. Eh, parece que eres el primer profesor quien, quien ha terminado entre el tiempo. <ríe> eh, bueno, ahorita eh, es mi placer introducir a Thea Villafrancos. Thea. Yeah, I'll try to be the second professor that finishes on time. Um, we'll see. Uh, I'll time myself though. Okay, so wonderful comments so far, and I think that there are already a lot of intersections. Um, just to briefly contextualize where I'm coming from, um, what I'm about to say will draw on uh, quite a bit of, of research experience and solidarity activism related to extraction and extractivism in Latin America, primarily uh, around copper, gold, and oil in Ecuador, and now around lithium in Chile. Those have been my main areas of, of research. Um, but I'm going to sort of bring us immediately into the present conjuncture for extractivism in Latin America, and then I'm going to try to address a couple of Don's questions, um, uh, and then we can work through the rest in, in conversation. So as we know, and as, as several of the panelists have already pointed out, um, Latin America is noted for its high levels of, of commodity dependence, of export dependence. And this 
is a legacy of its mode of insertion into the world system during the colonial period, um, but has been uh, exacerbated, you know, very recently, both during the neoliberal, the kind of height of neoliberal hegemony, we could argue if we're still in that period or not, um, but also dur during the recent commodity boom, which stretched for, for about 14 years at the beginning of this millennium from 2000 to 2014. There was a global commodity boom that really intensified extraction, extractive industries, and this export orientation of Latin America's economy. This coincided, of course, with a period of center left and left governments around the region. This has been mentioned by a few panelists already. And the, the combination was combustible, right? So there was a commodity boom, there were left projects around the region, um, in this context, you have the emergence of even more militant anti-extractive movements, in some cases in direct opposition to those governments, in other cases in opposition to right-wing governments that you know, prevailed in, in other countries. Um, and I just want to note that the politics and political economy of extraction in Latin America shows no signs of becoming less salient, and I think it'll actually grow in its salience um, uh, and, and potentially grow in the forms of resistance that it occasions. And I say that because we are now at the beginning of a new global commodity boom. And I just wanna sort of impress upon folks how unusual it is to have two commodity booms so quickly, one right after the other. The one at, at the turn of the millennium was in large part driven by China, uh, China's industrialization and other emerging economies that were rapidly industrializing. This one is driven by a combination of factors that include post, post I want to put that in quotes because the world and especially Latin America is suffering deeply right now from COVID, but you do have post COVID recoveries in, in, um, um, in, many, in, in some parts of the world, in the US and the EU where co the pandemic is not over, but there is enough of, a, of an abatement that economic activity is returning. And there's been a lot of stimulus spending, which tends to increase extraction as well as emissions. Um, but it's also linked to something else, which I think is tough to grapple with and that we should grapple with, which is the manufacturing of so-called green technologies um, and infrastructures linked to the energy transition, right? So these technologies, anything from solar panels to electric vehicles, wind turbines, are extremely mineral intensive. And that is actually a large part of the, the unfolding commodity boom. And I want to sort of note, again, like kind of how this will potentially affect Latin America. So we have a global commodity boom. We have Latin America being a place where many of those raw materials come from. Um, and in addition, there are other factors that might exacerbate the tendency to extractivism in Latin America. I mentioned already how bad the toll of the pandemic has been. We just reached 1 million deaths in Latin America. Relatedly, there's been an economic collapse of world historic proportions, double the level of the global contraction. So Latin America has had twice as bad a, a recession and depression than the rest of the world. We have the highest debt, sovereign debt levels in the world. So Latin America is the most indebted region in the world. And in addition to that, we've had high levels and very understandably high levels of citizen discontent with, um, with austerity and with the lack of social services. We had waves of protests around this in Chile and Ecuador and elsewhere before the pandemic. And we've had recent waves of protests, for example, in, in and ongoing in Colombia around these same topics. All of these factors, the economic crisis, the debt crisis, the fact that citizens are demanding social spending can potentially incentivize governments to double down on extraction. And this, of course, in the context of very high global demand for these commodities, right? So there's a lot of incentives for governments to continue and maybe even exacerbate extraction. Um, and in addition, this occurs in a moment of a lot of political uncertainty in Latin America, and I think very bad prospects in many countries for anything approaching social and environmental regulation or equity or enforcement of the right to prior consent. And complicating this further, we know that Latin America is the most dangerous place in the world for, for anti-extractive protests. This has been brought up a couple of times, but I want to like emphasize it. It is the place where protesters against extractive projects face the highest risk of injury, death, imprisonment, et cetera. So this is, again, a very um, turbulent kind of 
set of, 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 um, of features of this conjuncture where I think we'll see an exacerbation of, of extractivism in the near term, paradoxically in part in order to supply the raw materials required by technologies that are framed as necessary to fight the climate crisis. And I think we will also see a continuity of militant resistance. We are seeing that already. We continue to see that. But I think that resistance will grow. Um, and we will, I think, tragically see violent responses to that resistance from corporations and from states, right? So I think that's the kind of panorama of extraction in the present right now in, in Latin America. And I had you know, a couple of their comments in response to other questions, but I'm nearing on six of seven minutes. So I'm going to just kind of skip to a few concluding thoughts, and then maybe we can circle back to some of the other questions together. So I think that there is a huge amount to learn from Latin America's recent history and unfolding present uh, globally in terms of global lessons. I think Latin America is one of the places where we've seen some of the most militant and coordinated actions against extraction that um, have helped uh, stall, obstruct, or in some cases stop altogether extractive projects. And if in order to address the climate crisis, we need to keep fossil fuels in the ground, these types of tactics, direct actions, and translocal and transnational networks are very instructive for how we might actually do that. I don't think we can rely on governments to keep it in the ground, um, even if well-intentioned ones. Communities and, and activists have to, have, to to have to kind of stand the line around that. And we have a lot of positive examples to draw on from Latin America. Um, and then the, the sort of last thing I'll, I'll note is that so many, and this is something that Kristen said, but I want to just emphasize it again, you know, basically all of the, the, the main structural incentives for why extractivism is so difficult to dismantle in Latin America come actually globally from the imperatives of global capitalism. Um, and also, as I've mentioned, from the imperatives of global debt and just the way in which debt uh, uh, incentivizes governments to go for the easiest forms of revenues. And during a commodity boom, those are commodity sectors, right? So I think that it's hard to imagine a dramatic change in the pressures towards extractivism in Latin America without changes in the global north and changes in global capitalism. And that looks like reducing or canceling sovereign debt. And it also looks like changing patterns of production and consumption in the global north and among the global affluent in general. And I will end it here. <clears throat> thank you, Thea. Um, and thank you for, I think, also speaking last year, we were able to really tie together a number of the themes that have that have been discussed in this first round. Just a reminder for, for people, if they're just recently joining us, that we do have simultaneous translation, uh, that this is being broadcast live, but also, uh, and this will become more relevant as we go forward, there is a function here on the Zoom webinar where you can enter questions. Um, and we have some already mounting. What I would propose is that um, I had promised all of the panelists that they would have another round of seven minutes each to respond to, to reflect on, to think about the, the what was said in the first round. And I'd like to, to open that up going in the same order. Uh, if there's something you wanted to add or if there's something you wanted to respond to directly. Um, but you can also look at the, the Q&A function on your screen, panelists, uh, if there's something you want to directly respond to uh, in your comments. Otherwise, we'll, we'll come back and address them at the end. So uh, for now, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pass the, the proverbial mic back to uh, you, Wilson. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all the panelists. It was really, a, a you know, uh, insight into, you know, what we are dealing with in a global nature in regards to extractivism. And uh, what I think the first question was about, I think uh, globally indigenous people are often front and center and struggles around resource extraction. Does it provide a unique opportunity for solidarity or does it make the fight more difficult? I think it provides solidarity uh, because as we've seen on the with the panel speakers, we do have a lot of similar values and principles. And also we have a deep connection to our land and uh, a relationship with the trees and the water and, you know, all, all of the uh, creation. So that uh, establishes, you know, a unique set, you know, why we do what we do. And 
<clears throat> the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that's something else that uh, free prior informed consent and self-determination, those are the things that we are united around. Uh, Dr. Cheryl um, Lightfoot recently, she was appointed the United Nations representative for the rights of Indigenous people. I attended one of her sessions last week and she um, had some principles in two parts. There were um, general principles as well as principles for good relations with Indigenous peoples that the states should follow. The general principles were for protection of Indigenous territory, Indigenous self-government, uh, we say self-determination, <clears throat> and then self-development of Indigenous communities on the basis of equilibrium and harmony, free prior informed consent as a condition for development on Indigenous land, and the institutional redesign of the state in relationship with Indigenous people, and the principle of good relations as acknowledgement and supporting Indigenous self-determination, mutual respect, re reciprocity, collaboration, co-development, co-governance, uh, relational approaches grounded in ongoing negotiation. So we pushed in for the Union BC Indian Chiefs, we pushed for inherent rights and we've often worked alongside and worked with other Indigenous uh, peoples and nations and jurisdiction to help them advocate their rights. And the example that I, I had given was the Guatemalan uh, with their mining experience and issues. Uh, they had a panel in Vancouver and we particip participated on that and we continue to write support letters uh, you know, against those mining companies that are impacting their nations and we'll continue to do that. And there was one other question I seen in the <clears throat> chat. I think the chat was uh, with your experience meeting with people affected by extractivism all over the world, do you see a difference in extractivism in the global north and global south or is this a common universal pattern? And uh, uh, the issue is, uh, you know, the problems that I'm seeing, what we talked about today and when I'm in other areas is with free prior informed consent seems to be universal. The requirement for Indigenous peoples that our knowledge must be respected in decision making is so similar. Uh, the focus on economy rather than biodiversity by state governments is similar issue we face together. And, and when we do stand up for the land, uh, we do see the violence and we've had that in our territory and in uh, the province of BC and across Canada uh, a few years ago uh, because of the Wet'suwet'en uh, standing up for their land rights, uh, it, uh, it went uh, viral across Canada. So we, we had seen it just recently and we see it in our logging, our old growth issues and in Trans Mountain Pipeline where the federal government bought the pipeline. <clears throat> so they're in conflict of interest because they're the owners of the pipeline and they're pushing it through our territories. So we've seen all kinds of things like that that happen and it's uh, happening in other countries and it's happening in Canada and in our own nations. So we stand in solidarity with all of those nations that are here today and also the ones that are impacted just as our, much as our people here are. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chief Wilson. Um, I mean, one of the one of the things that 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 I've heard in terms of you know Canadian government and, and, and companies' actions is that they've you know they've been treating uh, Indigenous and First Nation peoples in in Canada like they're part of the global South. Um, so you know maybe there's commonalities because uh, we too have the South in the North, even the far North, uh, just like there are parts of the North and the South. Um, but I'm stepping on Kirsten's time. Um, Kirsten, did you want to uh, follow through or, or, or comment or address something in the Q&A? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Donald. And thanks to all the panelists. This is uh, really excellent, uh, I think, fodder for discussion. Um, I've been, I actually was thinking at listening to, Ju to Judy again and listening to Patricia about the sort of challenges that I think, well, on the one hand, that Indigenous communities are facing with respect to enforceability of UNDRIP or the ILO 169, like what are the limits and what are what is enforce what do enforceability mechanisms look like in a global capitalist system where these rights are being demanded, but there's nobody, even if a court gives them reason, even if the ILO says, yes, you were not consulted, who is there to enforce that process at the end of the day, I think is really challenging. And I and I just think of this example that, I mean, going along with what Tay has been saying, like, I just think of these egregious ISDS cases, these arbitration cases where, you know, for example, in Colombia, because of the protests that are going on right now, let's take a Colombian example, where um, the Colombian government decides to delimit 
a no mining zone around a protected wetland uh, called Santurban, a part of only Santurban. Uh, they delimit that. Uh, the Canadian mining companies that are inside it, which are all junior mining companies, um, are, have their uh, licenses revoked because now it's a protected area to protect the environment. And all those companies sue the Colombian government uh, for, for damages. Uh, and not just damages of what they invested, but future profit loss. So one of the companies, Ecoro, Minerals is suing the Colombian government for $764 million. Uh, and, and so that kind of a lawsuit uh, is, is it, and it doesn't go to a judge, it goes to a panel of arbitrators that work for companies in the supranational tribunal that's tied to international financing and lending organizations. And so at the end of these processes, which get dragged on for five or 10 years, which a, a country has to defend itself, um, pay for lawyers, pay for fees to justify why it took away those concessions. Um, at the end of the day, they're strapped with, um, with these bills that they have to pay because they're tied to international funding, uh, in, international funding institutions that then can enforce those decisions. And so unlike the UNHCR, the United Nations uh, Tribunal for Human Rights, Human, Human Rights Commission, there, are, there is no enforceability for violations of human rights or violations of indigenous rights or violations of environmental, let's say environmental disasters, like there is for the sort of the companies or the corporate side of that, right? And so I think that imbalance that Patricia is talking about when, it, when an indigenous community confronts uh, a company it's like an indigenous community confronting an entire system that's built against them. And so I think uh, it would be interesting to hear some reflections from, from Judy or from Patricia about what are some of the challenges of reclaiming those rights and how can we get to a moment where, where those are enforced. And I think what we've seen locally in terms of local strategies of resistance that have ended up being just as strong as sort of more um, rights-based approaches that may be legal in nature, is direct action, like Thea is talking about direct action in territory um, mobilizations to actively prevent these companies from encroaching on people's land, right? And, and, and unfortunately, as we see uh, in Canada, as we see in Ecuador, as we see in any of these communities that where there's an active, or Peru, where there's an active armed um, direct action to prevent companies from advancing their activities, those sometimes are accompanied by repression by forces. Um, but I think that we've seen that those direct any sort of action that like will not prevent the company from advancing any further and thus losing money have seemed to be pretty effective um, in their moment. But I think the bigger challenge or the challenges moving forward are like what Taya is saying, we're dealing with a context that's that's worse. If we could imagine a worse possibility, a worse scenario than the, the first commodity boom is definitely this moment where where the region is totally indebted. Um, where militarization is on the rise and, and unabashed, explicit militarization. Um, you know, it, it's, it's terrifying for me to think that in a region that was plagued by dictatorships um, for many years um, can now swing back to having the kinds of open, openly militarized and unabashed militarization in the streets like we've seen since 2019, beginning in, in Chile, moving to Ecuador, and now we've got Colombia. Um, and it, and it's, it's quite terrifying to think about um, if that move continues, um, where are we going to be? And, and, and most surely that um, repressive force is going to be used against, uh, is going to be used against uh, communities, frontline defenders, organizations that aren't towing the line um, to, to generate, you know, to, to, to as, as, as is used in Ecuador all the time, against the national interest, right? Against the national interest of generating revenue to pay off, uh, in this case, the foreign debt, right? So I think though that, that those scenarios are, are, are scary to say the least about where we're going, but I, I and so I do, uh, I do uh, wanna sort of temper um, my perspectives for resistance in this in this new scenario, right? Because I do think the conditions within which folks are going to be organizing um, are going to become significantly, or had the potential to become significantly more dangerous for their for their well, health and well being. And 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 again, though, I just want to finish on. I think that it's important as as you know, some of us are Canadians on this in this pan, in this panel, or or Americans, or you know, other members of other states that are sort of setting the rules in play, that are defining the rules of the game, and ultimately defining the terrain within which this these um, scenarios are rolling out. That we have to actually take control 
um, in our own in our own governments um, and and to make some change back home, right? I mean, it's it's very easy to say that our companies should act nicely, but if there's no legislation governing their behavior, then they're going to continue to do whatever they want. And and it's a it's a recipe a perfect storm for disaster. If Canadian companies were responsible for 700 criminalizations, 400 um, assaults, and 45 deaths between 2000 and 2015. This is data from the from JCAP from Osgood Hall in Toronto um, for frontline defenders facing extractivism in a moment that we didn't have the explicit forms of militarization that we are seeing now. Uh, I'm very concerned to see what this sort of free reign impunity will bring um, under these new under these new circumstances. And so I think we also have to be willing to um build build those alliances like chief judy is saying you know nation to nation alliances but us as self that don't form part of a first nation or that aren't frontline defenders also have a role to play i think in in demanding real change from our governments demanding real accountability um because ultimately it's our it's our companies um that are doing the damage right um and that are that are benefiting one way or another we're as a, as the canadian public we're benefiting from from the that um, those activities and we have the blood on our hands. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. And uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of questions in the chat or in the Q&A and the chat that are uh, touching on similar similar themes. And I think it, it's really important the, the the need for solidarity, the, the, the and but also the desire for solidarity. Uh, for people who want to find out how it's possible to, um, you know, fight these systems that seem so much uh, larger and immense than all of us, and find cracks where we can hold hands um, and, and fight it. Um, pero ahorita eh, tenemos Patricia Gualinga otra vez para responder, uh, reflexionar y, y expresar sus, sus opiniones sobre las preguntas, sobre las posiciones de los otros panelistas. Es, es, es su micrófono. Gracias, Donald. Eh, yo creo que voy a ir al tema de las preguntas, porque creo que en cierta forma coincidimos con todos los panelistas sobre el tema de, los, de lo que está ocurriendo en nuestros países. Eh, y creo que hay una pregunta que habla sobre extracción y desarrollo, sobre cómo eh, y, el, y la economía en la parte social. Yo creo que por lo menos en mi país, en los sitios donde ha habido explotación petrolera, no, no hemos visto desarrollo. A lo, a lo que van las empresas simplemente no es a fomentar una economía, a lo que van es a extraer y a extraer al menor costo posible a costa de todo. Cuando inician, empiezan ofertando plazas de trabajo, pero las plazas de trabajo muchas veces son de macheteros, de, de gente que limpia las hierbas y estas cosas, pero no hay una verdadera fuente de trabajo. Después ofertan temas que tiene que ver el Estado Central como salud, educación, y generan una dependencia absoluta, a llevar a una dependencia absoluta, y muchas veces a chantajes de que sí, hay oposición, ellos van a quitar esos, eh, esas obras que están. Entonces yo no, yo no he visto en ninguna comunidad donde ha habido extracción de recursos que haya habido desarrollo. Y, y denominado, de, tomando en cuenta el desarrollo como lo entienden desde la parte externa. Lo que sí hemos visto es pobreza, desnutrición, impactos ambientales, impactos culturales irreversibles y que esas comunidades quedan impactadas terriblemente y afectadas terriblemente, cuyo caso es difícil de recuperarse. Eh, hay otra pregunta que habla sobre extractivismo y deudas. En el caso ecuatoriano hay una deuda hacia la China, hacia otros países anticipada, con venta anticipada de petróleo. Hay una deuda externa terrible. Y hay una deuda con las comunidades porque no han hecho absolutamente nada para realmente apoyarles en sitios donde han extraído. Y hay una deuda externa como país, con venta anticipada de petróleo, sin consulta, violando todo el tema legal y aduciendo de que es para el beneficio del país. Entonces, ahí no vemos que haya realmente una, una cuestión de que pueda haber, eh, que sea beneficioso ni para el país como Ecuador y mucho menos para los pueblos indígenas. Si hablamos del capital transnacional, muchas veces las que operan son petroleras que no son muy conocidas, 
por ejemplo, en el caso de Sarayacu fue la compañía general de combustibles CGC, y ahorita está Plus Petrol, que está tratado de entrar, ambas sé que son argentinas, que son como las operadoras. Pero ¿de dónde viene el capital? Que es la parte que es la que, la que compete. La capi el capital está viniendo de los países que dicen ser desarrollados. Vienen capitales extranjeros, puede ser de Estados Unidos, Canadá, de Europa, de estos sitios. Ellos ponen la plata. Y al, al mismo tiempo se hacen los ciegos, porque no quieren ver las consecuencias de los impactos que está ocurriendo en nuestros territorios. Ellos ponen la plata, están allá... Y yo creo que hay que llevar a ese nivel la discusión. Pero aparte de eso, legalmente están tan bien protegidos, porque cuando hay un rebrote de resistencia, cuando logramos impedir que vaya, el perjudicado es el país, porque se, ellos se dicen en estado de fuerza mayor y van a la contratación que han hecho con el Estado y siempre salen ganando. Y si el Estado se niega, van a arbitraje internacional y siempre salen ganando. Las empresas están tan bien protegidas, mucho más que los derechos humanos, mucho más que los Estados nacionales y peor, mucho más que los pueblos indígenas a los que nos quieren invisibilizar en extremo. En ese sentido, yo creo que hay que estar muy claro de dónde viene el capital y cómo funcionan estos para tratar de usufructuar y tratar de ignorar los impactos graves que hacen que estén en nuestros territorios. La extracción como modo de vida, sí, pues ha basado su economía en petróleo, minería y todo lo que es danino. Hemos visto eso muchas veces. Y como modo de vida, de, de todo el tema de, de electricidad, de todo. Entonces yo creo que aquí tiene que haber una discusión más profunda de cambio de matriz energética en, en distintos niveles. Y eso tendría que ser una discusión que se tendría que dar. Si hablamos de crisis climática. He acudido a algunos eventos de cambio climático, de crisis climática, donde también el mundo occidental lo ve totalmente como negocio. Todo para ellos es negocio. Si no es negocio, no funciona. Mientras los pueblos indígenas lo vemos de otra manera, porque sufrimos las consecuencias de la crisis climática por más que defendemos. Nosotros no lo estamos viendo como tema de negocio. Nosotros estamos viendo como fuentes de vida, como núcleos de vida que comparten hacia el mundo, como aquellos hilos invisibles que se conectan para equilibrar el planeta Tierra. Ese es nuestro aporte vital como pueblos indígenas y el mundo no lo está viendo así, el mundo no lo quiere entender. Por eso mi pueblo Sarayacu lleva adelante la propuesta de selva viviente como un puntal fundamental de querer cambiar este sistema que está siendo tan destructivo para nosotros, los pueblos indígenas, pero sobre todo para el ser humano y para el planeta Tierra. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Patricia, por sus palabras importantes. Eh, Eduardo. Bien, gracias de nuevo. Eh, bueno, voy a tomar algunas de las preguntas, que son muchas, y avanzar también con algunas respuestas, siguiendo mi misma perspectiva. A veces es inevitable hablar del extractivismo latinoamericano pero hay que tener precauciones en el, en el uso de ese título, porque los regímenes de extractivismo dentro del continente son muy distintos y muy diversos. No es la misma la situación de México, que a diferencia de los demás países es un gran exportador de manufacturas. Tampoco es la misma la situación de los países centroamericanos por su patrimonio natural, por su superficie y por los tipos de inserción que tienen y la densidad de población. Por otro lado, en América del Sur, también una gran división esquemática que se puede intentar es de aquellos países de regímenes andinos muy volcados a minería o hidrocarburos, de los grandes exportadores de agroalimentos que son otro de los rubros extractivistas, cuyos casos más destacados son Brasil, Uruguay y Argentina. Cada uno de esos tipos de extractivismo implica diferentes conflictividades, uso del espacio, diferentes regímenes de propiedad, hay distintas comunidades afectadas, etc. Por lo tanto, yo tendría ahí una eh, precaución sobre eso. La otra eh, advertencia sería a que un examen riguroso de la conflictividad alrededor de los extractivismos, en realidad, más que unanimidades, muestra diversidades. ¿Por qué? ¿A qué me refiero con esto? 
hay muchos conflictos frente a los extractivismos donde las comunidades locales quieren coparticipar del extractivismo y demandan, por ejemplo, cierta transferencia de dinero o cierto acceso al empleo, o bien incluso coparticipar en la gestión, en el control o en la regulación tecnológica. Hay otros conflictos donde la demanda está en que el extractivismo sea pasado de manos privadas, usualmente transnacionales, a empresas estatales. Incluso hay extractivismos que son de tipo popular como la minería cooperativa en Bolivia. Y para hacer todo esto más complicado, estas diferentes opciones frente a los extractivismos también establecen conflictos entre ellas. Vean, por ejemplo, el caso en Bolivia. La semana pasada se acaba de conocer que hay tres confederaciones indígenas del pueblo de las tierras bajas, tres y dos. Usualmente había dos, como ocurre con la de las tierras altas una asociada al gobierno de turno y otra independiente, pero ahora tenemos tres. Y finalmente hay un último grupo de aquellos grupos locales que independientemente de la con compensación económica, la coparticipación o la indemnización, consideran que el extractivismo local encierra impactos tan graves que son inconmensurables o son inaceptables y lo rechazan bajo cualquier opción. Entonces, mi, mi punto es que eso es una gran diversidad, las alternativas y los horizontes frente a cada una de ellas son muy distintas, y eso me permite contestar una pregunta. Is building, um, uh, rebuilding and remaking transportation systems, uh, buildings, energy grids, uh, et cetera, so that, that renewable energy can actually be used, right? And so, you know, just to take one example, um, a key so-called green technology, and I put that in quotes a little bit, not because these technologies aren't needed, but we should question, I think, how green they are. Um, so that's the scare quotes. But anyway, one of these key green technologies is one that I do a lot of research on, and, and so does um, Don, um, uh, the convener of this panel, which is lithium batteries. Lithium batteries um, are needed to electrify transit, to reduce emissions from the transportation sector, which in the United States is the top uh, source of, of emissions. Um, and they're also needed for other reasons to stabilize energy and store energy on renewable grids. So you have these lithium batteries. What are they made of? They're made of tons of mined materials, right? You have lithium, cobalt, nickel, manganese, graphite, um, uh, copper wiring, aluminum casing, Etc. So these lithium batteries, which are needed, you know, to reduce emissions and transition to renewable energy, are are very mineral intensive objects, right? So that immediately presents us with the paradox, which is why is it that you know the the or or how can it be that the energy transition needed to combat the climate crisis needed to um, uh, to address the key demands of the global climate justice movement to rapidly transition away from fossil fuels might also unleash a wave of mining and extractive devastation to communities, people's ecosystems around the world, right? And that is a very uncomfortable reality that we need to think about, I think, very deeply. Um, and there is also already quite a bit of resistance in that sort of vein of militant direct action against extraction linked to green technology. So I've done uh, field work in Chile where there has been a lot of resistance to lithium mining. Also this resistance is spreading transnationally in ways that even cut across some of the binaries of global north and south, which we've already been talking about a little bit earlier. So we have resistance to lithium mining in Portugal, where the EU is really wants to expand lithium mining. Um, we have resistance to it in the Western United States, uh, led by indigenous activists and um, from the Paiute and Shoshone tribes, as well as from environmentalists, right? So we have an expanding extractive frontier around the world in part to create these green technologies. And we have likewise an expanding transnational networked set of resistance to them saying, there must be another way to address the climate crisis that doesn't intensify extractivism. And I think you know, that is the question that for me is, is motivating right now to my own work. How can we uh, uh, address the global climate emergency without deepening extractivism? And I think that circles back to something that's been a repeated theme throughout this panel, which is 
the need to take the climate crisis, the pandemic, the economic crisis as to treat them as these critical junctures where we can hopefully build differently, right? I don't want to use that build back better phrase that every politician around the world is using because I think it's, you know, a bit, you know, not, not quite bold enough, I'll put it that way, but we need to seriously dismantle these extractive models of development and, and um, replace them with something. I think the thorny question becomes about like, we do need some solar panels, right? We do need some wind turbines, right? I mean, even in a much, much, you know, degrowthed, um, scaled down, you know, economy that's not so growth oriented and not profit oriented, even in our utopian economy, we would want to produce some of these things. But I think the key questions are, how much do we produce? Who does it benefit? Under what terms? Who has the right, you know, to say no to extraction on their territories? Who bears the burden of extraction? Why is extraction always falling on the same people's communities and ecosystems, especially when it's actually a geological reality that these minerals in many cases are not rare. It's not, an, it's not just destiny that extraction is so often cited on indigenous territory. Um, it's because certain people are treated as disposable or sacrificable. This extraction could happen in other places and affect you know, the people that don't usually pay the cost of extraction, right? Um, there's also questions of recycling and reuse and just thinking differently about the material world and treating nature as something that is precious rather than endlessly extracted, right? So I think there are a lot of changes that, that could be made to make the energy transition less mining intensive, but I do think it, again, raises thorny questions for rapid decarbonization, which is something that we also need to do, again, given the, the, the suffering on the front lines of, of the climate crisis. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Thea, and, and thank you, everybody. Um, we have about 20 minutes left and a, a, a series of, of great comments. And I, oh, hola, Tika. Um, a series of great uh, questions in the Q&A and on the chat. I'd, I'd like to invite uh, all of the panelists to, uh, to join us in, uh, in the, the video. Uh, and hopefully we can have, it, you know, it's inevitably gonna be difficult. We've been doing this for over a year, um, but try to have something like a, a, a conversation. Um, one of the things that, that I'll just say is um, in, in noticing, this is gonna be my attempt to synthesize uh, far too much really important uh, information, but it, one of the things I'm struck by in looking at the Q&A and the themes that have come up in the commentary by the, uh, the participants is the way in which, uh, like we're talking about extractivism in, in multiple registers. There's an there's a academic question that has to do with defining extractivism and the utility in, in finding some sort of common substance or practice between uh, pumping uh, lithium brine out of the Atacama and devastating aquifers in the Andes and uh, cutting down what's happening right now, Ferry Creek in BC, you know, cutting down some of the last stands of, of old growth forests. Um, and so I think Eduardo's call for conceptual clarity on recognizing local difference, I say academic question, but I don't mean to wave it away as an academic question, it's just, you know, where are the common lines of, of struggle and experience? And these were some of the questions that were brought up in the Q&A as well. There's also what I'm going to call a, a political question, um, because not only are we talking about extraction and the process of, of removing materials from the earth, uh, we're also talking about sovereignty. Uh, we're talking about laws and constitutions. We're talking about um, decolonization, autonomy, and autogestion, um, which again, it's all tangled in, but these moments of clarity I think uh, can help. So we've got the, the academic question of defining extractivism across experiences, the political question of, of what is to be done uh, to respond to it and to address the harms that have been executed on peoples and, and places. Uh, there's a cultural question, a thorny question that got brought up in the chat and which Eduardo addressed this, this thorny cultural question of people who identify, like extractivism is also a way of, of life, a way of being in the world for, um, you know, artisanal miners, for example, uh, loggers for, for entire societies. It's a way of defining Yourself. I used to live in Venezuela. There'd be these huge banners that say "Somos gente de petróleo," we're oil people. Um, you know, this was like an official sort of identification of people with state. 
And then again, there's the, the, the epistemological question that I think Kofi Wilson, Patricia, and everybody else have, have, have touched upon, um, which has to do with the, the, what extractivism depends upon, implies, and reproduces is a relationship to the earth that sees us as, as separate from the earth. And the earth is, and nature is just a reserve of resources to be exploited and turned into commodities. It's there for our taking rather than, than part of us. And this is all tied up in the, the dynamics of, of extractivism and also touched upon in the questions. And so uh, that's my attempt at synthesizing in the hopes of uh, getting some of these great questions, adequate responses, um, but also to uh, once again, invite and, and thank all of the panelists for your engagement, for your participation, for your time. I know you're all um, um, very, very busy people. And so I, and I'll thank you on behalf of the audience. Uh, I'm very grateful that, that you joined us today. Um, I'll open it up now. This is going to be a free for all. Are there any questions that people, uh, members of the, the panel, would like to respond to directly? Uh, questions, denunciations, uh, comments? I'm going to hit mute because my five year old's having fun upstairs. Okay. Yeah, uh, this could be Wilson. I just wanted to say what are Indigenous people, our values and principles to live in harmony and balance with Mother Earth and the water? And I think we can see with global warming and climate change that that's calling for all of the world to do that. And our indigenous knowledge is there to be able to um, show the people how we can do that, that it doesn't uh, need to have such a, uh, you know, reliance on dirty oil and fossil fuels and, and such great extents of mining. Uh, all of that needs to change. And I was in a, a Zoom call last week and I was saying, you know, this is what it must felt when the industrial revolution was happening and uh, you know they had to make a decision to continue that way or change <clears throat> and in a lot of our prophecies already our indigenous people across all of north america and probably most likely globally we do have those prophecies that we have to make a decision either other than that mother earth makes her own decision and mother earth doesn't need us uh, we need mother earth so we need to be taking better care of Mother Earth and the water and uh, change the way we're relying on capitalism and extractivism, just extracting, you know, to, to and it's who is actually making all the money, it's the 1%. So the 1% doesn't, as I, uh, Patrice, I think mentioned that nothing comes back to our indigenous communities really the only way it comes back and is in form of poverty in forms of programs and services that the federal government gives our bands, which is not really enough to sustain our people. Uh, they become very dependent on programs and services. So it starts a cycle of poverty and a cycle of oppression in our communities that started when the reserves were created. Um, so, you know, for us, that's why self-determination is the antidote for colonialism. Uh, my uh, cousin, uh, Chief Arthur Manuel, used to always say that, and I understand that now it's taken a while, um, but I understand we have to make our own self-determination and managing our territories and our resources, and uh, we, do, we don't call them resources, they're our Kusaltan, our relatives. So I wanted to add that points of rights of nature is very much how our our indigenous people think of our uh, plants, our trees, and our animals, all of them, and our wild salmon, all of them have rights. All of them have, you know, those are their homelands that they survive in and their habitat, and we need to protect them. And uh, we just have to educate more and have these global shifts that are needed so that we can start uh, working in a better way uh, to be able to live in a better way where we're not damaging the earth the way we're doing because it can't sustain it. We already have so many reports and, you know, scientific reports and the government doesn't want to uh, recognize them, but, you know, that's what's happening. And it was just atrocious that our federal government, uh, the Trudeau government, you know, bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline because that's going in the wrong direction for climate change totally. They're totally, they're trying to justify it you know, uh, at the at COPs, at the climate change meetings, and, you know, we're going to be there, and we're going to be pushing back pretty hard, because, you know, it's, it, no matter how they paint it, it's still, 
you know, it's it's a, the wrong contradiction in regard to climate change and where we need to go as a nation. We need real leadership. And I just think our Indigenous people are the ones that are showing that and the ones that, you know, have been working to support the earth and the environmental issues all of these times. We're actually converging and working together now. And I think a, a large part of the, you know, society is is understanding that and learning that now. And, you know, society has to make those decisions we put in government and government has to make those decisions. Like in, I think it was where, you know, some of the countries have been acknowledging the rights of the rivers and then some of the ones that are recognizing the rights of nature now. So uh, those are the harmony and balance we need to bring. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Kirsten, uh, Eduardo, Patricia, um, Thea. This is um, <clears throat> this is the, the 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 universal experience of the pandemic is the, the the waiting for the social cues that would normally come naturally um, to to kick in. Uh, Eduardo. Solo quedan muy pocos minutos. Solo eh, parte de mis manías que no 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 tienen por qué ser compartidas. Y creo, y le apuntaba a Donald, que en parte me parece que uno de los problemas es a la inversa de lo que él describía. Porque la necesidad de precisiones con las definiciones partió de la búsqueda de alternativas. Era la necesidad de alternativas a los extractivismos que requería definir qué quiere decir extractivismo. Porque si extractivismo es todo, desde la soberanía, hasta mirar Netflix, se desvanece la posibilidad concreta de resolver alternativas con políticas públicas, que esa es la urgencia que en este momento se enfrenta. Solo ese, ese apunte aprovecho para despedirme porque ya son los minutos finales. Muchas, muchas gracias. Me perdonas, eh, estoy en problema con mi pantalla. pantalla. Eh, creo que estoy de acuerdo con, con su comentario, eh, eh, Eduardo, es que eh, solo estaba tratando de, de, de hacer un una resumen de, de perspectivas y una de, de las perspectivas es que hay una serie de experiencias concretas del extractivismo que están multiplicando en la agricultura, en la minería, el petróleo, etcétera, etcétera. Y sí, estoy completamente de acuerdo con la necesidad de hacer definiciones eh, específicas también por la razón que uh, mencionaste, que es tenemos que hacer eh, alternativas concretas al modelo extractivista y al modelo desarrollista que, que, que tenemos aquí en las Américas, todo el mundo. Um, pero nadie está aquí para oír yo. Uh, Patricia o uh, Wilson o Kirsten o, o, o Thea, tenemos solo pocos minutos. Eh, y, y el régimen del tiempo aquí en LASA es, es atortario. Entonces, uh, Patricia, ¿quisieras añadir algo? Sí, estaba pensando de que, bueno, hay pueblos que están trabajando o, o que están dentro de los bloques de explotación, ya sea petróleo o minería. Eh, y muchas veces, en muchos casos he visto que dicen, bueno, es nuestra forma de vivir. Pero cuando va, voy a des, al inicio, al principio, al origen, es que ya no les queda otra, otra posibilidad. Ellos en algún momento se resignaron a, a la posibilidad. Ya, ya, no, ya no pueden eh, luchar, están como atrapados, tanto en su cosmovisión como en su forma de vida. Yo no sé si eso es desarrollo. Yo creo que eso es, eso es a, a adaptarse. Tal vez podrías hasta, hasta hacer resiliencia y decir, bueno, tenemos que sobrevivir. Pero eso no creo que sea desarrollo. 
O sea, los pueblos indígenas como nosotros que luchamos no queremos ser así. No queremos resignarnos a decir esto es nuestra forma de vivir, perdiendo mi principio, mi esencia de, pueblo, de mujer indígena que siente lo que es la naturaleza y que va contrario a nuestra cosmovisión. Entonces, no sé si me dejo entender. Si sí hay estos ejemplos, los ex existen, pero ahí yo no veo desarrollo, ahí yo no veo bienestar, ahí yo no veo el buen vivir. Yo vi por ahí una, alguna pregunta sobre si la constitución podía cambiar. Nosotros tenemos una constitución que es de avanzada, pero muchas veces se quedan en letra muerta y depende del pueblo, de la ciudadanía, impulsar a que eso se cumpla. Claro que es una herramienta útil que nos sirve, pero eso ya depende de nosotros porque los gobiernos nunca quieren hacer cumplir. Perfecto, perfecto, perfecto. Gracias. Puedo decir totalmente Eso. de acuerdo sobre el comentario sobre la Constitución y una, quizás una reflexión muy urgente e importante para el pueblo chileno ahora, ¿no? En esos tiempos que van pensando en, en sus propias reformas y procesos, ¿no? Yo creo que es, es muy buena reflexión que hace Patricia. Sí, pero I think at the same time too, others have pointed out um, from experience, in for, you know, for example, in, in Canada, um, there, there are you know, supposedly treaties in parts of Canada. You know, BC, as, as, as Kofi Wilson pointed out, is, is you know, all unceded territory virtually. Um, and so I guess the question is, is, as Patricia just pointed out, as Thea has pointed out, I think as, as all of us have, have mentioned in one way or another, is that you know, laws, treaties, and constitutions are meaningless without Uh, people power without using them as as the tools they could potentially be uh, making them, them them better. So, and this is also a theme that has come up in in the Q and A. Thea, did you want to add? No, I mean, I just want to say that I I agree wholeheartedly with Patricia and, and Kirsten. Though I I would I guess caution against that seeming like it's not. A, a good outcome for these struggles over the law to sort of become part of popular politics. Like I think, and I don't think Patricia or Kirsten or you, Don, are suggesting that, but just to say that I think the, the sort of um, trajectory in Ecuador shows that in, an, I, in a sort of paradoxical way by the state not enforcing the rights of prior consultation, communities have really taken it into their own hands and, and organized these consultas comunitarias themselves, which now are actually re-entering the sort of like legal, officially recognized sphere, like we saw recently in Cuenca with a successful cons consulta to, to, to not have mining in, 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 in watersheds that are vulnerable, right? So kind of these trajectories of struggle are complicated. You can get something in the constitution and then it, no one enforces it. And then communities say, well, we're gonna self-enforce it. And then that can become a very powerful thing, right? And I think we could see some, something similar in Chile where when movements see some ownership over the constituent process, they, I don't think will just like sit idly by while state and corporate actors don't enforce um, and can come up with even more creative ways to self-enforce um, and kind of use again, combinations of indigenous justice of legally recognized norms and of direct action to at the least slow down the ex expansion of extraction. And if not, you know, actually in some cases obstruct it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I think uh, at, at this point, it, it makes sense for me as chair to uh, once again, thank uh, LASA uh, and, and CALOX, the Canadian Association of Latin American and Caribbean Studies for, for this event, um, to thank the president um, of LASA, Gioconda Herrera, for, for helping um, drive, drive this, this event. Um, this really came, out of both a collaboration between the organizations, but also from her, um, her uh, experiences in, in Vancouver and, and witnessing uh, the indigenous struggle uh, in Wet'suwet'en uh, against, against pipelines. And so um, this was an event that I'm, I'm so uh, honored to have been able to uh, participate in. Uh, I want to thank all of the panelists once again um for for your your thoughts for your uh, inspiration and for um for your work and um 
we'll uh, hopefully we'll see each other again on the front lines and then in the better world afterwards. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, 